I'm going to stand up here so that we can somehow connect up the video and what I'm saying. I just want to thank Marilyn and Nisi for organising this and inviting me to Tasmania. I've just forgotten how nice Tasmania is to come to and how nice Hobart is to come to. I came here some years ago and rafted down the Franklin when there was no water and we had to lift the boat <laughs> half the way, but I still managed to fall off a few times. Uh, and uh, which reminds me of my, what my almost favourite heroine, who was Jane Franklin. And I don't know, a lot of you probably know of the story that she insisted on accompanying her husband on an expedition was to explore the southern Tasmania and find the Franklin River. And against everybody's advice, she joined the party of men and walked from here to the Franklin River through the horizontal scrub. She was meant to stay in a, a chair that was lifted by the men, but she threw it away after the first day. So she was some lady. But then, of course, when the Franklin e expedition got stuck in the ice looking for the Northwest Passage in the Arctic and died, they all died and disappeared, Lady Franklin, as she then was, with her own money, organised an expedition to go find a husband. So she was some lady. <laughs> now, just thinking about CMT, our nerves that work our feet come from our spinal cord, the cell body. If it's the size of this room, on the same scale, the end of it is in London. <laughs> so this is our problem with CMT. To get goodies down to your feet, you might as well go down to the wharf and put them on a sailing ship because probably it's the same. It takes an awful long time to get delivered to your feet. And we're working on how to fix this because, as we now know, there are at least 80, probably 100 different genes all causing different varieties of CMT because the effect is the same, the lack of something down to your feet. It looks the same, but in fact, we're all different. Every CMT is different except for the common variety CMT1A. And even those people are different in different families and different at different ages. So CMT is very special. Every person is different. And we have to deal with each person separately. Now, as finding a cure for CMT, well, people are moving ahead on that. In America, it requires big screening efforts. And they're doing what we're now doing, which is taking, uh, some of you here might have even let me do it, take a piece of skin Put, take it to the lab and turn it into a nerve cell, look at it in a dish, and then screen for things to make that trip to England better. And we're working on it. We've got a couple of varieties in my lab that we're working on that nobody else is working on, supported by the association here. And you'll hear a, bit, a little bit more about it later in the video. So something's happening in this area. And I just wanted to just show this first thing. Those things are the railway line. And, and, and that's walking to England. <laughs> so those little legs are actually walking. That's a molecule that's doing that. It's called a molecular motor. It's sort of, and this is nanotechnology. And those things that you could see are not railway lines, they're tubes form and break up. They don't have trouble building West Connects. It forms today and gone tomorrow and, it'll, and it remodels. So that's what's going on. We ha some of those molecules are involved in CMT that you just saw. Okay, now we'll go on to the next bit. Now, in my talk, don't worry about the detail because this talk is basically written for science people and I've just somehow got to give you a general flavour. So, well, I'm actually a neurologist and I've been got involved in genes when the first gene was mapped. This is who I am, my grandfather. See, when the first, when I was a young doctor, I heard in the news that a gene had been mapped to a chromosome using a particular technique. And I thought, that's where I'm going to work because 
in the future, we'll be able to map every one, and that's happened, and then, and then apply them to disease. So I looked at problems that we might fix, and that's why I got involved with CMT and neurology. Next. And that's where we are, the Anzac Institute and Concord Hospital with the mangroves around it, the only hospital in Sydney sur surrounded by Sydney Harbour. Next. And that's, yeah, that's just showing a bit of Sydney for overseas people. And of course, just quickly for people, in case people haven't, don't know about this, CMTs divide into different varieties depending on the mode of inheritance, whether it's on your X chromosome or whether it's on, another, on the main autosomes and whether it's dominantly inherited or recessively inherited. Dominantly means passed down the family. Recessive means it'll be in brothers and sisters and not the rest of the family. And uh, that's how we used to classify CMT, and we still do at a neurological and clinical level. But now we've got a new gene test which will look at all the genes at once. Once we've screened the, for the common gene, we can do this other gene test which looks at all our 22,000 genes that we have, and we screen for those known to, we look on a computer at those that are caused CMT, and we can find, as I'll show you in a minute, about 50% of the answer. Next. And so here's our nerve cell up in the spinal cord on the right, and down in your foot on the left, and we're looking at transport, which goes two directions, to England and back from England. Next. And this is some of the molecules involved in CMT. And you, as you can see, they're involved in all the different parts of the nerve. It's not just one, it's many different parts. Which is always a surprise to all the researchers because initially we thought, well, it will be simple, but it's not. Next. And then when we look at all our uh, CMTs or hereditary neuropathies, we find, I don't know if we've got a pointer, but we, on, the, on the far side, we get the answer in something like 30, 40, 50 percent of cases, and then there's the rest. Well, there's no gene mutation, and when we look at every gene, we turn the whole lot over, that's, nope, it's not there in those genes. So, it's definitely hereditary, so it tells us that it's happening somewhere else, not, not in the genes, but in the area surrounding genes. And what do the area surrounding genes do? Well, was, you remember the book, Dawkins' book, saying this is junk DNA, we, we're full of junk? Uh, that was a bit, it's a bit hard to swallow. It was for me because I thought, well, if we've got it, it's got to be useful. But actually, the wheat genome is much, much bigger than the human genome. and has much more junk DNA in it, but it's not really junk. It's there to make better gluten and food in the wheat. But could we read it that way? All this stuff is actually useful. So around the genes, I'll talk about it later, are control elements that control the action of the gene. And to me that's very important because that 50% that we can't actually diagnose now are probably going to be regulatory genes, that is the turn off and turn on genes. And if they're switches, why can't we fix them? Why can't we turn them on when they're not on or turn them off when they are too far on? So I think for the future, when we find these things, there'll be treatments. Next. Can't behave. Yeah. So now when we look at, use these fancy new techniques, and to look at all these 22,000 genes at once, it costs us 15, the cost to us is $1,500, which we charge to, because that's what it costs, we have to send off to a factory that does this, and the factory happens to be in Korea, but it's, it's certified by US methods and using US stuff. So it's acceptable to the uh, New South Wales Health Pathology that we work for. Well, we look at then, we've, it might be your family here, and we look at your family and we look to see, we find a, an interesting gene that seems to be an irrelevant gene for CMT, but we're not quite sure whether it's a normal variant or not. So we need more blood from other people in the family. Next. And then we screen it through other people in the family, and then we see that it has to fit certain criteria. And then we think, well, this might be a guard. This might be a new variant that's causing CMT. Next one. And this is just an example of one such gene. Next. And, but we want to know whether it causes damage or not. So one way to do it, which we're using in our lab, is to see if it stops 
a little worm wriggling. Because li these little worms called uh, C. elegans is used in many labs for functional things. Because what we want to know is if we put this gene that we think is bad into the nerve of this worm and it can't wriggle properly, well then maybe it's causing damage. So it just shows the worm's nervous system down the bottom. Every, I think it's 209 nerves, every one is known, next. And we do a wriggle test, and next go. And that's, that's the sort of thing we see under a microscope. We can label the nervous system green and see if the connections are okay, next. And we found in some, they don't wriggle properly when we put a bad gene in, and they, the, the wires don't connect up properly and so we think they're damaging. So that's one way we can work out whether a variant is damaging or not, next. But that's research. So now we've got an, a new gene that I'll talk about a little bit more because it looks like a, a good candidate for trying to work out a treatment. This gene is involved in making energy. And this is something I haven't talked about it, that obviously nerves are electrical. They are wiring and without energy, you know, you've got to turn the plug on before it'll work. So we need a lot of energy and to get the energy we break down sugars to make energy. And this mutation in this gene that we found in a rare variety of CMT blocks the production of energy to some extent. Next. And this is the way it sh we, there's a big enzyme shown as these blobs which is important and it has a molecule on the side, you can see SER serine, which is normally phosphorylated next. When it's active like that, we phosphorylate it, uh, there's with the P's on it, it, it turns it off. And we found that the mutation in this family with CMT turns off that, stops the P's coming on, the phosphorylation, turns it off. That's why they don't have energy for their nerves. Now, because this thing's called a phosphorylation and a kinase, that's druggable. There's many of those causing many different diseases and other medical things, and there's many drugs known that'll affect phosphorylation, so we found some compounds which will turn off that bad phosphorylation and therefore restore the energy supply. So that's what our current work is on because we have drug candidates that will work in this situation, in this form of CMT. Next. And then we're going to put it back in the worm and see if it, the worm wriggles properly. Next. And this is the guy, <coughs> uh, Gonzalo Perez, from, who we recruited from Spain. He's working at the bench and it's his project. Next. And this is another diagram showing where does the energy come from? These things like balloons that are down the bottom are in cells. They're your mitochondria. They produce all your energy. And this enzyme is situated in the mitochondria. And we think that's how it's working because it's not working properly making energy. Next. And we can actually see it. So like in the control picture is normal. And from a CMT patient, we've got skin fibroblasts. We took a little piece of skin. We grew them in there, and we, you can see with the green shows too much phosphorylation. So we've got a little assay here that we can now use to screen for drugs that'll turn the green off. And if we can find one that is harmless to people, well, then we might trial it. And that will be a whole big new project. But only for one particular variety, one particular, one particular family. And of course, to trial drugs, you're talking about millions of dollars. And that would probably be an international trial because it's a rare, rare, rare disease, rare form of CMT. Next. Now, uh, well, the other thing we're doing is getting those skin cells. Next, we'll turn to the next slide. And we can make nerves out of them in the dish. And that's, they're stained there. Some of that uh, picture is a picture of nerves in the dish. Obviously, we can't make the full length, but we can make short nerves and see how they work. And we can look at their transport and other things in the nerves. Next. And this is the group of people in the lab. 
Tom Jarlow on the right, and a PhD student there, and Megan Brewer, who was do were doing the worm work. Next. Now, next, a changing subject. Getting back to the unknown, as I mentioned before, that 40% or 50% of patients that we screen all their genes, we don't get an answer for what's going on. And we think it might be part of the structure of DNA gets screwed up next. And this talks about what happens. There are many different rearrangements in our DNA. Between every generation, we get the DNA gets rearranged, picked up, sometimes moved. Sometimes big bits get shuffled around and sometimes little bits. We've, we've, the duplication here shown here is a relatively small bit. That makes the common variety of CNT. But down the far end, there are bits which are very large, that is, millions of bases long, that also get rearranged. Next. And we found one such. We found a very big family with X-linked CMT. It wasn't in the usual gene. And actually, it all came from a New Zealand family, which was just huge. If you pull out the family tree, it would go from here to that speaker over there, all from one man from Scotland. And we found in it that a bit of DNA from chromosome 8 gets pushed into the ends of the X chromosome. And then what, how does it cause CMT? We don't know yet, but there are some genes around it which you can see here in this blue. Next. And the interesting thing is that if we look up the literature, we see it's the only, not the only thing that gets rearranged into that spot. It's, it seems to be a spot prone to getting tangled. And there's a piece of chromosome 1 here it gets stuck in there and you get families with droopy eyelids. You get another one makes a sex reversal, another one makes a hypothyroid thing and another one makes a hairy man. So something's going on in there when a piece of the wrong DNA gets put in you get different diseases. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, this is not the one guy from Scotland makes the CMT variety, but these are from different rearrangements from other parts of the genome. And when you look at the, because the bit, you know, the, I think they say a bit of your DNA and a single cell goes from here to the moon or something like that, it, it gets tangled up. It's easy to, you know, it's just like a fishing line, it gets tangled up. And then when these tangles happen, bits get broken off and put in the wrong place. Next. And that just shows all these different ones make different diseases, but there's something very tangly about that particular spot. And we know that there are loops of DNA that get, that get like hairpins in that sort of area, and they might get tangled up. Next. And so this is a, a picture put in here of how a gene works. A little bit, you can't see it very well in the middle. The gene is surrounded by regions which are not gene, they're just ordinary DNA which turn on and off that gene and regulate it. So we're very interested in the regulation. And on the far side, that little diagram, it shows a bend in the gene and how different bits of the gene, which are shown in color, now interact because now they're twisted and bent so they can interact. So there's something going on in 3D, not just 1D here. So as you can see, this is how we are organised, and it's complex. Nick. And we found another family with a similar thing, another rearrangement. We'll just go on, runs in a big family, makes CMT. Um, next. And again, it's, it's an insert of a big bit of DNA with lots of genes. And as yet, we don't know which one of those is causing trouble, if any. Next. And that to do this, we look at the sequence coming off the sequence data, which we send to Korea and get the data back. And the, what you get back is like a hard disk. That's one person's coding, fills a hard disk. Then we have to search for it, for the bits that are causing trouble. And we need an informatics guy, which is what we've got here. Kaito is a new guy who works in informatics, worked on genes, he actually worked on the wheat. And he uses algorithms to go to look for these rearrangements, things that, should, that are happening that shouldn't be happening. Next. 
and this one will just go on so this looks normally but this is what's happening like a rearrangement in this case a bit of one we'll just go back uh, a bit of one cro the same chromosome gets picked up and stuck back in itself and that makes CMD a different variety Thanks. How, what, how it's doing it, we don't know. If we can work out how it's doing it, maybe we can fix it. Now, uh, we'll just go on. So, what are we doing? We're, then, we're looking at these things by getting you, taking your skin, growing it in a dish, using different ways of converting it into a nerve. Next, then we can see what's going on. This just shows the same thing. This is all terribly expensive. To do it for one person is something like $20,000. And then what we do is, we, once we've got those, it can't, obviously can't work when we're working on nerves with skin. So we've got to have those, make that $20,000 bit of nerves in a dish. And then we have to see what they're up to. And that's called expression analysis. Then we look at these things, these red triangles as the genes in, in the area and how much they're expressed and whether they're interacting with each other. That is this 3D business. Next. So I'll just go back, go back to that. So what we do find is that these genes are interacting through some sort of a three-dimensional arrangement. And we have to work out what's going on. And there are ways that we can do that. And that's what we're studying. So that is very new. It was presented at the Human Genetic Society of Australia by Marina Kennison, whose work it is, um, a, f a few weeks ago. And most of the people doing genetics work in Australia hadn't heard of it. So this is really very new stuff. Next. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about trying to treat neuropathies, not just CMT. With the support of the CMT Association, I've got a pilot trial for this particular variety of neuropathy called hereditary sensory neuropathy. It causes a lot of skin problems of your hands and feet and because you can't feel pain, it's not a good thing, you end up with ulcers and eventually infections of your bones and amputations. And we found the gene for that and it's in an enzyme and this enzyme has mutations but we found the weird thing is that they don't affect its activity but then we found what it did, it just made the enzyme do naughty things. It, it picks up the wrong food for it, the wrong substrate, and makes a poisonous product, because the body's never seen it before. So it makes sense to give more of the good stuff to stop the bad stuff getting in. And that's what the trial is. And this is just an HSN foot with a foot ulcer that wasn't felt and they can be chronic. And if anyone, other varieties of CMT can also do the same thing. If you've got lost enough sensations like diabetes, you don't know you've got injury to your feet. The next thing is infection. If the infection doesn't heal within six weeks, you could be in major trouble going to go into your bones, you get amputations. So that you need help early before that happens. Next. So I looked at the patients that I've had over the years and to see the, how much that sensory loss is spreading up their leg and up their arm and found that it was approximately two centimetres a year. And so what we're doing now is a study to see if we give this extra serine, whether we can stop that movement upwards and just, just stop it in its tracks. So the earlier we get people like that, the better because the less damage is going to occur. And I think that's going to be true for any form of CMT. If we've got a treatment, It'll have to be early before damage occurs. Next. And so, as you know, you're all here today to learn a bit more of CMT. I've just put down for, I, I'm working in the clinic and closely we've had the CMT association has been supporting patients for a long time. And this association was the second in the world to get together long before England, long before America. I talked about it in England. They set up an association and because of, you're going to need help from the clinic, our diagnostic lab, our researchers I've talked about, orthotics, which we're going to hear about more today, and podiatry, 
And then, of course, genetic counselors, if you don't want to pass on your CMT. And if, then if you've got problems with your feet and difficulty walking, maybe surgery, but we've got to think about that carefully. And of course, we need a lot of help from rehab and this might end us up with some expenses and hopefully NDIS is going to help us. But so no one place solves your problem. A CMT is a multi-area problem. We need someone like the association that you can go to to work out where you go and how you deal with the problem. And Denise has been manning the phone for a long, long time and she needs some extra help answering questions and heading people in the right direction. And the other thing that's come out recently is that the NHMRC and government funding for grants is now asking, it's all right for you to do research, but show, we have to show that you have community involvement and feedback from patients that you're treating. So CMT has been doing this since a long time ago. So that's now mandatory. So CMT Association, not only important for your support, it's important for our support. It's important for research support. Next. Now, two new projects have come up recently. One, we found one variety of CMT is associated with what looks to be macular degeneration. And it takes an expert eye doctor to see that it's not the, not the ordinary sort of form of macular degeneration. It's a different one. So I'm very interested to hear from anyone whose families who thinks they've got uh, a CMT with some visual problem that's happening later in life after 40. The other one is we've got some breakthrough in a, a family that we have a form of CMT that's associated with <coughs> people who are always doing this, <coughs> clearing their throat <coughs> and then sometimes coughing. And sometimes coughing so severely they nearly crash the car because they cough, cough, cough and they can't control the car. So if you're, anyone's got that in the family, we're interested to know more about it and see more people to go looking for these new forms, that new form of CMT. So I'd be very interested, you, people could come up later, I'll be here lunchtime, if you, you want to tell me if you think that's relevant to your family. Thanks. Just wanted to say thank you to my lab and other people who've done this, mostly all you've heard about the research things is due to the people working in the lab, under Marina Kennison who's been working with me for 30 years and uh, she's now got the a lot of interesting things happening. Now, and I, I think I've finished. Let's just see if there's anything more. I don't think so. That's it. So I was worried that I'd run over time, but I don't think I have. So we've got time for questions? I've watched the program. I'm always interested in anything. what's going on with a particular gene, we want to make it in the exact, compare it to normal. So what we do is we cut out the bad one, put in the normal, and make it normal so we can look at it in the dish. But if I was to try it in you, how do I make every bit of you back to normal? I can't, unless I get a virus that'll infect every one of your cells, and you mightn't like it. Oh, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> that might make cancer, it might make everything, everyone's saying, well, Oh, we're not going to start doing it for people. Well, if you think you could correct it for a fetus, but it doesn't make sense to correct it for a fetus when you can just have the next fetus who doesn't have it. So that's that's a doesn't sound right to me. Oh, I just want to say one more thing about drugs. So we'll hear some more later about <coughs> drugs and CMT. Because people always ask me about will something affect their CMT or not, and then when we're giving, when I'm doing a trial like that, giving something which is nominally normal, it's actually a food supplement. Any drug that's working will have side effects, and that's the test. If it doesn't have side effects, 
It's not working, right? So that's the, that's the trouble. So any natural therapy that people tell you is going to help you and it doesn't have side effects, you can be assured it's not working. <laughs> I'll stop. Any more questions? Yeah. Yep. Um, I've found that I'm 83 now. Um, uh, the two things that make a difference to me is if I have a, if I have a good strong coffee, the caffeine does to give me a boost. Um, and the other thing is an ECG. I've had four this year. And once I have the ECG, the walking confidence is, is, is much improved. I can walk whenever. Well, I'm going to give you electric shots in my own introduction. They're the only two things that I've found that would give me any help. Yeah, well... And, and of course, the, co the caffeine, I'm trying to restrict it to once a week, otherwise... Caffeine? Coffee should be three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's good for plants, too, Frank. Really good for plants. I have a prostate problem, and I... I've uh, uh, not been with caffeine for two or three years. And when I eventually did have one, it was just like I turned the clock back three years to one point three years now. Well, caffeine, caffeine, the wonderful thing about caffeine is they haven't shown that it has any bad side effects, but does have some side effects, so it is working. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, just wondering if the CMT, when it's diagnosed in children, often is associated with um, visual like problems, just mild sort of problems that would be normal in another child, or auditory, like mild deafness or anything like that. Is that very common? There are CMTs with some deafness, definitely. Some of the CMT genes are very closely related to the deafness genes. Uh, yes, so oh. it can be. And as far as visual things in kids, not that I know, except one variety of CMT does make squinty eyes. Yeah. It can affect your, the way your eyes work together. Is that one of the 2A varieties? It's, no, it's... I'm just wondering, because my daughter has uh, astigmatism and um, CMT. Yeah, well, I'd be interested to talk about that later. There is one of the genes, DNMT2, that does that. Right. It, the Victorian family we've got. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for your lecture. So you did a, a nerve test on me about 10 years ago and now I have a constant cough and collapsed windpipe uh, problems uh, yeah. well, uh, and increasing numbness in hands and feet. Perhaps we should talk about that later yeah. and particularly if it's happening to other people. The, the nerve to your larynx is a long one because it comes from your brain, it goes down into your chest and back up to your larynx. So if you stretch it out, it might be about that long. So if you've got a form of CMT that's affecting the ends of your nerve to that level, like from here to here, up to here now, that means you know, you're getting older and it's, it's gone a bit further. Yeah. It can affect that and breathing. Mm. And I guess people know about that. Some people have difficulty at night breathing uh, and the way to check that is when you're lying on your back your stomach should be going up and down as you take breaths because your diaphragm is pumping it up and down but you, if you've got this long nerve not working properly to the diaphragm that's not happening you're not breathing properly at night you need a, uh, a sleep apnea test yeah, I have that machine my doctor called my misery cough. She's tried everything for the last five years and hasn't got a clue why I've got it or what to do about it. Somebody, a misery cough. This is probably it because what's happening is uh, you're getting a little bit of a dribble into your throat because you're not clearing it properly and because that junction's not working properly because the nerve is not working properly to it. Uh, and it can be blamed for asthma and things. Last question. Yeah. Yeah, um, during your talk, you were speaking about the interaction of your clinic and various groups. So I was just wondering, um, I've seen a few email um, snippets of information from the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation in yeah. the USA. Yeah. And it just seems that in the recent couple of years, they've had um, pretty 
huge donations um, of funds from the American government to, to look into this. I was just wondering, um, in comparison, how generous is the Australian government in assisting your work? And secondly, um, what liaison you know you have with them and perhaps other worldwide organisations? Because I gather that you don't want too many people all researching the one thing at the one time. I guess you must um, send your findings back to each other and decide who'll do what. So I was just interested in the, the funding and, and um, the information sharing and how you sort of move on to make the most of what you've got. <laughs> Uh, it's sort of like football, competitive collaboration. <laughs> Thank you, Garth, for that.